Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Startup Studios podcast with Raj and Seth, where we interview people who build startups. How are you doing, Raj? Um, I actually feel really rested and like that hasn't happened in like 39 years. So I'm, I'm doing good, actually. I'm going to ride that train. Uh-oh. Well, that's usually a bad sign if something oh, changes. <laughs> sure. I hope I'm not jinxing it. <laughs> All good, man. Okay. I'm excited. It is. It's it's a beautiful day. It's an awesome uh, just time to be alive. And I'm just super excited to welcome our next guest, Donna Laughlin, who uh, what we're going to our viewers are going to get to know. But when I first met her back in uh, downtown San Jose at the LMG, our, uh, LMG PR offices with my buddy Rand, um, you were known very much so as the PR she devil of Silicon Valley. And this was about maybe 10, 11 years ago. So I'm excited to, you know, really dig into that. Um, I remember uh, a little bit about your background from back when uh, you were uh, uh, one of our mentors and advisors for startups, as well as on our board for PR. Um, so I'm I'm super excited. It's been and, 10 years already. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, that was I a fun time. You look too. so good still. <laughs> no, so do you, Donna. <laughs> well, and I'm so grateful for you to take the time and, and join us uh, on this episode. Well, I, I think that, you know, the PR she doubled, um, I, it came across from a venture capitalist and I won't um, give his his name, but, you know, I guess I, I am, you know, I, I like to say, I you know, there's angel investors and there's angel accelerators and um, I'm, I'm the, you know, the PR she double because of the, you know, I'm very strategic in, in what I do for my, for my, for my clients and the, in the tech innovation sector, but you do have to be, you know, a little devilish, even though you're, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're really the, the angel in the, in the works. Uh, and if I were a, you know, like a, a Charlie's angel, I would, you know, <laughs> and, and you were, uh, I, you know, I think that it would still, you know, come down to, you know, what is the impact that I'm making and with my clients and the business that I'm in, you know, I, I strive, you know, that's a goal after 500 you know, plus startups is that you do have to be a little bit of a devil and a little bit of an angel, you know, kind of, kind of combined. No, and and from back in the day, it was that energy and and a lot of the, um, you know, the, the, the no shits kind of attitude and stuff that you brought to a lot of our portfolio as well, which was so valuable. And and uh, considering we worked with a lot more early stage companies at, with the accelerator. Um, it was, it was a really good exercise for them to go through as well, because, you know, you're, you're kind of going from the shy, timid entrepreneur to now being like, okay, this is what we have to do. And to have an advisor like you to, to guide them along the way was super. Um, well, fun. well, that's the thing though, Seth, a lot of us, like, cause, and I don't know if you know my background, um, Donna, but I, I, sometimes you can have empathy. You can be understanding. You can be the best. But it's a competition and you're hired and you're going to win. So I think it's really interesting that, Seth, you framed it in a way that most people can't see and they'd be lucky to have a Donna. Most founders and entrepreneurs don't know when it's time to turn that switch. They actually don't want to. They're like, OK, uh, here comes a term sheet. Maybe, no, like you're at the table for a reason. And a lot of people don't have that support. I wouldn't call it tough love. I mean, I don't know how Donna does it, but like you have to be like, hey, time to have some agency and some ownership and get this done. Like enough. Yeah. I call it tougher love because I have to be totally transparent and tell and spend your and spend particularly early stage company like the money's in my pocket, right? And and so that does mean that you're not necessarily you know want to hear what I have to say or the guidance, but you have to hear it. And I had that exact same conversation with a company that I just brought on board. Uh, sometimes I get I'm a retread. I get the a, you know company to work with that hired an agency or hired a consultant for the wrong time with the wrong intentions and wrong direction sometimes. And I have to go in and and I hate to say it, be janitorial services <laughs> and kind of you know clean things up. But it's really important to know at at every stage, you know, with a younger company, and as you know from an accelerator, is the there is a, a right time and you know, to start spending money in certain areas. And I typically come in six months after 
uh, the product is developed. And so sometimes I come in when the, the literally it's a, a chalk, you know, chalkboard or whiteboard uh, talk and the product is in, you know, is about to go into beta. Uh, so sometimes, you know, the opportunity starts several years before the product ships. Other times if the company is, you know, that it would be a very well-funded company. Um, other times it's, it's maybe six months after the series A and they're going to announce or ship within six months to a year. So the stages in which I enter varies. Um, seldom is it a company that's had a product for more than five years. Um, typically, it's in the you know the earlier stage of the company, and I think that's what myself and my team is known for. LMGPR stands for Leadership, Momentum, and Growth, and so we we strive to work with uh, with our clients at uh, the very early stage to establish their their presence, their their voice, their leadership. Um, then the momentum phase, you know, comes once you get the product out and as you start, you know, actually getting revenue. Uh, and maybe you're, at that point you're in series B to C. Uh, then there's your exit strategy discussion. You know, are you is are you going to exit? Or are you going to be in acquisition? Um, sometimes we get calls for companies that say we only want to be in acquisition in six months. Help you sell. And we've done a few of those. I mean, we've launched companies in ten days. We've actually sold companies in six months. <laughs> so, oh, that, no two alike. <laughs> that, that, that was a, an awesome intro for how this episode is going to play out. But before we get started, Donna, I'd love to introduce you to my co-host and buddy Raj, who uh, has his own personality, which I'm I believe you're going to. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I'm quirky. I'm I'm a rounding air of a person. So uh, it's a it's a pleasure to meet you, Donna. Now, my background actually started in finance, so I started in the banking sector, uh, energy investment banking at Goldman down in Texas. I left after about 11 months because I knew what I wanted to do. I cobbled some money together, spent the next you know 12, 13 years building out uh, a hedge fund. So PKUM was about a billion eight. Um, had an exit, turned into a health and wellness guy. So probably my second passion. But I think it's really interesting. You know, I had a brick and mortar that turned into a sash or kind of got into the tech, but I'm I'm not a tech person by design. So I think it's wildly um, appropriate and effective for me to listen to you because I don't have my brand. I don't have my story. I'm not a technical founder. I didn't go to Amazon. I didn't do this. I'm from Texas. Hello. Living in Seattle without a network. So, you know, we're actually at these stages. It's a great of, title for a book. I'm from Texas living in Seattle without a network. Was that a network? Yeah. Or that breakfast taco. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. Because a lot of people will get it. But they, but I think that's what's so interesting because now I'm I'm at a point where I'm realizing, you know, you're reading all the things and 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 you could be whatever. And I know that's very general and whatnot, but you know, I was reading um They Ask You Answer. And I, just one of those books that just seems so interesting that marketing and PR, I mean, you can sell the product 90 90% sales done before they even get to the product itself. And I just, you know, when you really frame it like that, it 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 just changes the whole game for me. It does. So I'm super excited to just kind of dive in and, and see where we can get some wisdom. wisdom. So We're when you're getting you a lot of probably played Monopoly, right? Sorry? Being a finance person. You played games like Monopoly and finance yeah. type games. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it was... a story. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, let like... Let's dive right into Donna, your your story. So, I mean, to get us started, who is Donna Laughlin? Yeah, well, you know, I, I grew up in Silicon Valley before it was called Silicon Valley, before it was tagged that, because it wasn't really tagged that until, you know, in, in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, grew up, you know, in the majestic foothills of the of the valley, the East Valley, look, you know, apricots and cherries and, and uh my sisters all cut cots. And by the time I was old enough to do that, that segment was gone. And, you know, you hung out at the mall and you played, um, you know, gen, did Gen X things. You, you played at the video arcade and and uh, went to Farrell's ice cream parlor and, you know, things like that. Uh, but I was always, you know, very curious uh, and precocious, I guess you'd say. I, my father and his brothers owned a printing publishing company and so after school, when I was a little girl, I'm talking, you know, before junior high, I would go every day after school to the print shop and printing business. And I was literally in the back of the shop. And so 
some of my favorite, you know, memories of the smell of ink and that, uh, that you know, the pagination of, of, of glue on paper. I mean, so the family owned 40, uh, 40 um, newspapers. So you think of the community papers like the Palo Alto Times and the uh, Las Gatas and, and Las, Al Las Altos Crier and all those types of papers up and down the San Francisco Bay Area, parts of the East Bay. And a little bit up in Napa and Sonoma, so I had the I was I had the opportunity to be exposed to the graphic side of the business, but also the editorial side of the business. So I was, uh, you know, constantly, you know, to, it was my preschool. I remember learning to spell using type from, you know, like you do printers type, uh, painting and drawing by using opaquing and things that you use in graphics, and then on the on the editorial side. I would follow my uncle behind and other people and on their on their news stories. So they would go out in the field and they would do stories and I would go with them. It would, it would be sometimes it would be a, an actual I remember going to um, FMC, you know, very food machinery corp, a very large defense company in the valley that was, you know, pretty instrumental HP as a little girl uh, when it was still, you know, it was a publicly traded company, but it was still, you know, wasn't the the magnitude of, you know, which it was by the time I was out of college. And I would follow. And uh, by the time I was eight, I had the courage to speak up and want to do the interviews myself. I had a small problem. I had a really bad lisp and I had, I had, I couldn't pronounce certain letters, THs and CHs and certain combinations of letters were extremely hard for me. But when I put on my little reporting hat and I actually became a reporter and not the kid, and I'm talking like between eight and like 13 years of age, I had a magical power. I actually was able to overcome a little bit of acting, right? So I took a lot of speech therapy, a lot of um, acting classes and different things that just to build the confidence. And so by the time I got to high school, I didn't lack any confidence. I was uh, editor in chief of the high school paper, uh, two years in a row, I was class president two years in a row, junior and senior year. I, I kind of had the keys to the kingdom, <laughs> at least I thought I did, right? So when you're at that age, you think you know everything. You don't, I didn't know anything. And then I went off to school and I studied journalism formally. And I went to Columbia University. I was there for a year. It was extremely challenging for me. Not the academics uh, and not living in Manhattan, because I love living in the city, but Socially, um, expense-wise, it was very challenging. Coming from California, which is a little more laid back, um, it's a little more, uh, I'm going to say, free-spirited. And when someone says, "Here's your daddy," <laughs> in New York City, typically it means you're, you know, you, you literally, it's like my dad owns a publishing company. Well, they took that as, oh, it must be Simon and Schulster, or it must be, you know, some major publishing house. And so that was challenging for me. So I came back to the West Coast and I finished at UC Berkeley. Um, simultaneously, I actually got a degree at San Jose State too. So I am a San Jose State as well as UC Berkeley undergraduate. Don't ask me how I did any of that. And then I went out into the world and did my news reporting job. So that was kind of, you know, I had my career started pretty young. <laughs> I must yeah, say, though, I didn't get paid either. So child <laughs> labor, you know, there was, I did get paid. I got paid in, in uh, you know, I guess accessibility and, you know, and, and it, was, it was great to be in a family business. Man, super cool. I think it's just so interesting because you've been swimming in words literally your whole life. Yeah, yeah. So... I've been, uh, I know. <laughs> I, I mean, like, like you, like, myself. if if the pagination and the smell of ink is like, I remember like pooping in my diaper, you're like, nah, 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 nah. Watch this silk screening. Watch this silk screening. I'm like, good Lord, that's cool. Right. But I also like to smell of lavender and chamomile and, and vanilla too, and cinnamon. So that's good. Kind of <laughs> knocks it off. You don't smell ink anymore. And and so to go through the, all that and then get it into college and the digital boom is beginning to, you know, frontier. I remember yeah. my father saying he was going to sell the business because he saw that the computers were going to replace the family business. And now he's getting close to retirement. And I remember, you know, when I was in when I was in college and I did an internship, I ripped out of the 
Wall Street Journal an article about a small little company that just delivered its first affordable computers to market, and that was Apple. <laughs> but I ripped it out and I took it into the managing editor at the Wall at the Washington Post. I'm an intern. I'm not an, you know, I'm not a full time staff, and here I am, no joke, in my in my hand me down navy blue suit and you know accessorized to the nines. I was the, one of the only females that was actually in the editorial team. Most very male dominated industry. The women were in the administrative pool. Well, I typed 150 words a minute, so I typed myself right out of there. I said, I'm out of there. Thank goodness, my, my mother told me to take typing. Type myself out of there. We're still using typewriters. And this is like the early 80s. And I'm like, this is nuts. I walked in and I said, we need one of these computers. I can learn how to, to operate and do this computer, fearless. They're quite expensive, though, compared to you know the prices that we have today, right? So I convinced them. And three weeks later, Big box came. Literally, it was like uh, the Christmas story when the major prize comes and it's a lamp, leg lamp. Everybody stood around in the newsroom and this box came with a big reveal. Talk about an unboxing, right? The unboxing of this, this Apple Lisa. I get to, you know, be the, the queen of the Apple Lisa. It didn't do much in retrospect. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably like, Pong was, you know, to, uh, but what I could do is, is to write stories, share, and I could actually edit quicker than I could print out. It was the first time that I remember seeing getting, making the connection. It's no longer just a, a, I mean, it could have been very heavy uh, paperweight, right? But it was actually, we were automating the newsroom. Three years later, the entire newsroom was automated, right? There was no such thing as Bloomberg terminals until, you know, we had to go through that whole phase. So I find that was really fascinating how quick, and it was the same way the, the time we went from vinyl to, to CDs in that same period, right? And I remember fighting that battle because I love vinyl and I have a big vinyl collection. I mean, where, like, don't take my vinyl away. And so the record industry was changing. The motion picture industry was changing. We still had Blockbuster, but we didn't have Netflix. But that was next, right? And so if we look at the acceleration of how quickly things started to change and our behaviors had to adapt to all these changes as well. So there was a lot going on in, you know, in my college era. And so when, when were, were all these technologies being introduced like during college or were you exposed to them right after? No, oh, we were still using <laughs> the, you know, the blue books for essays. Um, there was no Google. We had Texas Instruments. Um, no, we, we weren't on the internet yet. I mean, the internet, the internet revolution didn't start until the 90s. And so, you know, we're talking the 80s here. So by the time I got out of school, out of college and I took a professional editorial position and I was with Reuters, Reuters International, which is now Thompson Reuters. And that was my military duty, what I call my military service, is I had to be ready to go, an assignment anywhere from six days, six weeks, six months. And so that took me all around the world. In seven years, I did uh, 42 countries and and then somehow I added in another 25 or 30 on my own as if I'd go on assignment for a length of time, then I had time to travel. But what that experience gave me was discipline, 15 minute deadlines. I would do as a, a field reporter. And so I would carry my microphone, my little cassette tape. Keep in mind, we don't have a smartphone we have today. So it was advanced considering at the time it was advanced micro, you know, mini microphones, right? And uh, my notebook. And eventually I had a flip phone. My first phone I had was like bigger than a shoebox, right? And then a flip phone and then mobile service because, you know, we didn't have all the cellular plans and things that we have. So it was interesting to write about. I was business and economics reporter, and naturally some of that became innovation and technology. And then I 
went, uh, I worked in New York, Chicago, and London. And then when I was in London, I had the opportunity to work for the BBC. And of course, because I'm American, they said BBC America. <laughs> you're gonna be the you're gonna be the Yank reporting on stuff, you know, uh reversal. Yeah. So that was like my first 10 years of of of, of my of my you know professional career. And the great thing about it is I got paid to travel, interview, and talk to some of the brightest and smartest, you know, people. And and to be able to be part of this this whole generational change that was happening as well in terms of innovation and technology and communications. Wow. And, no, that Donna, is and real quick, did, did Reuters still have the financial lean back then? Or not? I mean, has it, like when did you who, were Reuters? Have a financial lean? Like, do they still kind of like, because I know I, you know, I was a, a trader, so I did a lot of Reuters and on the finance side. So like not financial times, but a lot of finance, but was, has, was it the same kind of perspective back when you were working with them or is it still kind of run like all the news across kind of the, across everything? I would really um, just go for them on the finance side. I just don't know if they've shifted it all for now that they saw the tech, now that they saw the innovation, they're like, Hey, we, listen, this is the next thing. Yeah, no, typically, uh, you know, you have these little borough offices, they can like little, little studios, right? Right. And I was in, you know, I was really fortunate. I never worked like small metros. I went for the major market, the major, okay. the major markets. I got, I don't know what door, sliding door, grease cookie sheet or whatever, but I fought hard and I interviewed really hard to get in places. And when I, you know, and, and you have to move around a lot, particularly broadcast journalism and communicators, they start in like Fresno, California. And then, you know, that if you're lucky, if you do your chops and you can get to Sacramento, and if you get to Sacramento, well, you know, you're going to make a big, you're going to get to Chicago or New York. It, it, you have to move around a lot. Um, with written reporting and communications, you have to do a fair amount of that, but it, it's not, it's, it's not, I think there's, there, there's more, um, at least there was, <laughs> not as many now, but there was more written journalist. But I could kind of pick after five years where I wanted to go. I yeah. say, so, you know, I want to go. I was, I did my stint in Chicago, which is a great place to be. And then I went, I went to New York. I did that. Well, now, where do I want to go? London actually was the gateway for international. So there I was. Anderson Cooper, I could see him, you know, 50 yards away. I look on the other side and I would see another major network. Um, and so that was, you know, I, I always strive in my career to feel like I'm on the verge of excellence. I'm pushing myself. And I think this is kind of the entrepreneurial spirit and why I connect with entrepreneurs. If every day I wake up, after I do my manifestations and all that stuff that I like to do, I don't drink coffee, so I percolate a little slowly. But I always feel that something is about to happen. And and that element of, of like unexpected, you know, I, something's going to happen. Something major is going to happen today. And and as a news reporter, that's constantly that discovery and what you look for is you look for the unobvious. Anybody can see the obvious, but you have to look at, you know, it's like listening to music. There's there's reason there's just different genres of music. I, I used to tell my kids, I don't care if you don't want to read, you need to find a subject matter that you like to read. My son wasn't interested in reading for the longest time, but then he discovered pirates. And it's like the whole world of pirates opened up. You know, he was like six years old. And all of a sudden, pirates. What do you learn about with pirates? Well, you're going to learn a lot of history. You can actually learn. He got interested in math because of the pirates, like how big were their flags and how big was the ship and the mast and stuff. And so that's the same thing with, I find with innovation and technology is we have to look back in time and we have to rediscover things. And so Raj, when you mentioned the, um, you know, I said, well, you're probably good at Monopoly and finance. To me, that's just kind of a given that, that you beat me out of Monopoly because I, 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 I'm not so great at math, but I ended up becoming really good at math because I wanted to fly an airplane. And I was 12 years old flying with my father. And I said, I want to fly. And my father literally said, you're a plane, which is a common term. I had to learn math in order to fly a plane. Oh, Donna, you went mute. But, and then I had something that I actually could apply it to. Right. And so I think that's really important in innovation and tech is that 
I'm not a, I don't have a degree in engineering or science or any of the STEM specific skills. I wish that I did because it would sometimes make things uh, less complex. But then I realized I had a, a superpower, which was asking the right questions to break it down to a non-technical person so that then I can bring it to market. And I've learned a lot over the years by working with amazing, bright-minded people and in the science and innovation and tech and all the things that sometimes are in my head. I'm going to go, oh, I know about that. I know about that. I know about, I've been working on artificial intelligence, robotics, autonomous and, you know, cybersecurity and stuff for, you know, more than 25 years now. And so, and those industries have changed so rapidly, but I do think in my, at least my generation, we weren't as encouraged, at least girls were not as encouraged to take the hard stuff. And I made the hard math and the hard, you know, science. And I took them, but I wasn't encouraged to take them. I took them because, because I always like to be challenged. And I think if I had been encouraged more, I might have ended up, you know, taking a more technical degree. But when I was at UC Berkeley, I remember walking through the School of Engineering on purpose. And my friends would say, why are you walking through the School of Engineering? I said, because this is the future. This is going to be, this is like Steve Jobs and all these, you know, they know the, the, the two Steves and these different companies. This is the future. This is where all the nerds hang out. Uh, the DNA is going to fall off on us and we're going to be able to just be smarter. With those same friends, they don't laugh at me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Seth, like I, I wanted to like, like interject like five times, but Donna, oh, you were just dropping so much knowledge. Two things that I, I'm, I'm actually going to take it back a little bit because we talk a lot about, well, follow the thread. You said something that was really interesting. You said, I, I always felt, and I don't, I think I might've missed the context. I was projecting something in my brain. You were like, I always felt like there was something about to happen. Were you saying about like in your life or are you saying in news, you have to be like that to be a good journalist. I thought you were saying like for Donna, you always had this sense of like, man, oh. something. So I love you. I have to ask, because this sounds like bullshit. <laughs> they were about to happen because you made them happen. I, I have to, I want to call a spade a spade here. It's like, okay, all of a sudden there's computers because you walked, you walked in there, kicked the door in and said, hey, I want to do this. That's why that next thing happened. That's really bold of me, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, come on, you made it happen. That's why Donna is programmed to think something with Pavlov that something's going to happen because Donna always does that ish. And I love it. And the only reason I to say that because we all fight this imposter syndrome as founders and entrepreneurs. And, and it was so articulate right there. I'm like, you're like, how am I at this table? You're at the table because you worked your ass off to get to that table. So like, I, I think it's really cool, even with such success, like still with a humble, but like that shoe was going to drop because you were, you were doing it. It wasn't coincidental. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, thank you for that. You know, I'm five one and three quarters, and with that goes, <laughs> with that goes, you have to have really tall ideas, right? And I think that was the, one of the other things is is that I I knew when you you go in and you know like resumes, I never think really tell the full story, right? And I remember filling you know my resume and going in for for internships, but I had ten years of experience, and I'm you know. 18 years of age. And they'd be like, well, why did you get so much experience? Well, because I started when I was eight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's, and again, that kind of leads to the second point, because I also heard you saying, and I think this is a stigma that, I mean, I 100% know I had mom, dad, sister, brother, all physicians that went to medical school. And I was, and I did, I stopped, you know, but then I was like, so I don't have that medical degree. I don't have that STEM but you said something like, maybe I should have gotten it. I think about that too, but let's be realistic here. Who's going to go to market? Who's going to sell? Is it the devs and the engineers who are like, okay, this is the feature that we're going to push? Or is it the person being like, great, I made, I'm glad you made the feature. Who's going to buy it? Yeah. So it's it's so interesting. Like, um, And I, I talked already about the, the you ask you, you know, uh, they ask you answer, like 90% of sales are even before they come to the product itself. So it's like, man, half a problem identified is half a problem solved. Like I'd rather talk to you for 99 yards of the football field. And then, Hey, dev engineer, you get one yard, shut the fuck up. And like, let's do it the right way. So I like, it's so funny. Like everyone's like, he has a PhD in potatoes. And I was like, okay, who cares? Who's going to sell the potato to the potato person? You know? Well, you know, it's interesting. Cause my dad, uh, was Does he have a PhD in potatoes. 
No, no, okay, no. Sorry. no. <laughs> didn't mean, I didn't no, mean he was a Navy guy <laughs> turned journalist. Uh, and he ended up back in college in, at age 78 to get his master's degree, Come which on. I think is pretty admirable that he wa he wanted to continue because if, if I'm retired and if I stop learning, I'm not the most might as well just die. No, so he ended up, you know, going back to school and getting his master's degree. But my father always said, if you know, if you want to be a journalist, that's great. Be a journalist, right? But you better have something to 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 talk about or write about or have a passion. So history was, you know, was something I was always very passionate about. And but I my my minor was uh you know was British Empire history, which was kind of silly, but it was a lot of history, a lot more history to learn there than was US history. <laughs> so I chose that and then I sprinkled it with economics, which was painful for me for a while. But going back to the airplane, I had something to apply it to. So I always felt that, and I think this is the thing with kids and STEM. I have worked now with STEM robotics groups and STEM, you know, um education programs. And what I love about it is you get children of all different learning abilities, autistic kids and, uh, you know, that have talents and, and mainstream kids that have talents and kids that are off the chart genius level have talents, but when they all come together and collaborate and work, they do amazing things. And I think that's been the best part of reinserting what I call the fortification of STEM is that we took a lot of the good bits out of curriculum. And now we put it back in. Yeah, well, let's, uh, we were back on your BBC days. So yeah. I think, so BBC, yeah, right after uh, after your undergrad, you're still traveling the world and, and doing all this amazing journalism and, and news reporting. My Bridget Jones era. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, where, where were, what what was the mindset? What were the single? <laughs> <laughs> well, that that could be part of your aspiration at that time too. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a great experience. I I had been to England uh, and Scotland and Wales before that, and spent some time there. But to work there is very differently, right? Because when you're traveling on, on a holiday, uh, you know you 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 see things through the eyes of a tourist. Well, I was immersed in living there. And it's different because all of a sudden, you know, I was the yank and I, and as much as I thought, oh, I very accustomed to fitting in, I was, I stood out, uh, not by dress, you know, and attitude, but you know, probably some cultural nuances. Um, and I also learned that if somebody was not going to be kind to me being American, then all of a sudden I became either very Canadian or defensive because <laughs> everyone's everyone's kind to the Canadians. But uh, living in, in the UK gave me was uh, just a, even more discipline because now I was operating at an international level. I had to make sure that I had extreme open consciousness and buying to not what's just happening in, in the United Kingdom, but the rest of Europe. And it gives you a different uh, perspective when you're actually going within, you know, hundreds of miles to totally different countries, thousands, and you see, you know, where World War II took place and and kind of the how the proximity things were and the multicultural and facet. I grew up in a very diverse community in in San Jose, but going to re, as a reporter in, in any major city, whether it be Chicago or New York, where I also work very very diverse and but at the international level, you realize I have to actually be reporting and creating stories. Somebody sitting in their living room in Poughkeepsie or in Tennessee, or perhaps in, you know, Upper East Side or in, in the Royal family is going to be watching this or listening to this episode because we did radio and then we did online. And so I had to push myself to what I call, it's like making a, a Martian a sandwich. You, you, you know, we all know how to make a sandwich, but if you're going to teach, a, you know, an alien or a Martian landed and you want to say, well, make a sandwich, you're like, how to make a sandwich. So you have to start. It's like, how do I had to start from scratch? And I had some really great mentors uh, that helped me kind of break down my journalism, you know, the down to a core, um, 
I must say it, it wasn't British. It wasn't necessarily a way of reporting, but the BBC has a very specific style, very stylistic way of reporting the truth. Now they also have a very, very um, unique way of of sensationalism as well, and the tabloids, you know, or, or you know, people thrive by the tabloids in the, in the British. But I also spent a fair amount of time in, you know, in in the Middle East, um, Israel, um, Saudi Arabia. I spent a fair amount of time in Africa. Uh, so the, all those opportunities, again, have to, like every time you go someplace where your passport is going to be used, you have to be really open-minded and conscious. And I think I always lead with a place of acceptance, not expectance. And as a reporter today, I probably would be fired. Because we're not a lot of unfortunate things have happened with general basic reporting is certain media outlets, reporters aren't allowed to necessarily report the truth or to report. It's it's what the popular truth is. And so I come from with a very old school, just the facts and report, you know, content. This in the tech and innovation sector, it still is pretty much the facts, right? Um, it's who you are, what do you do, how do you do it, how much cost, and is it in the box or is it in the cloud? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? But I but I still think that the, the basic fundamental, you know, components are there. Oh, that's uh, that that like the the at this age, I'm I'm surprised like how your ego didn't really explode because you're still young, you're traveling the world, you're working with these amazing like international brands. But then I know that you're because when I met you in San Jose, you were completely 100 percent just focused on early stage tech companies, including hardware, which was extremely, extremely hard back back then. And like I'd love to get a sense of like what what made you come back to that? Yeah. That's another story. So one thing more I'll say about the UK that it also gave me was appreciation for where I came from. <laughs> so after I did all that, I decided to get my, my my graduate degree. And so I came back. I applied to I think four schools in the US and I ended up back at Berkeley. Um, they have a great graduate journalism program. And I knew uh, one of the professors I had worked with um, or I, I actually worked with was a student. And then I also did some like post-grad stuff, um, like in the summers, I'd come back and teach and things like that. He was the head of the department. He said, you know what? I don't even know why you're thinking about anything, any place else that this is the school, J school is where you belong. And you could also continue to work in the Bay Area. There's so many things happening, you know, in, in the, in the um, healthcare segment, the technology and innovation. And I thought, you know, I had to go back with all this experience, with all this wealth of knowledge, and look at things from a different perspective. And it was really healthy because, as much as we oftentimes think that we need to leave, you know, you always hear these stories about the small town girl or boy, and they went off to Harvard and they, you know, whatever. Um, and there's stories of, and and you go back to your roots of what you, your family and your origin and what you stand for. And I remember there was a time in my life, I just, I kind of wanted to get away out from all of it. I'm the youngest, you know, I worked with family business and, and it was great, but I needed to see the world. And then I realized, okay, I've been there, done that. It was great. But now what can I bring back? Right. And so it's, it, it, and so that experience for me was a little bit of a homecoming. And I went back into being, you know, the program was designed, you could be a working professional if you are a working professional, it was going to take you three years. If you were a full time, it would take you two. So I went the working professional route because I needed to pay for it as well. And that was not easy. I went from living in London where I was full time in a small flat and I had two um, uh, housemates that were British Airlines um flight attendants. They were never home. So it was great. I had the whole place to myself. And then I go to Berkeley. I'm in a studio apartment with a Murphy bed. And I look up one night, I'm like, 
I didn't know I had wallpaper. Then I realized it was just totally wall infested with like little cockroaches. And I'm going, oh my gosh, like, what am I doing? And I realized, you know, this is part of the experience. I left that place pretty quickly. <laughs> Let's see that. <laughs> but I had to like frame my my life because I had a goal. It was going to be three years. I was going to work, but I also was going to go to school, which meant a big portion of my income was going to school. And uh, I was fortunate enough that I was working where the BBC uh, has still has you know decent presence in the Bay Area. And then one day I went to go do a news story and do an interview. And the what was a company called Precom Corporation. And the head of the communications called me the next day and she said, Oh, thank you very much for interviewing, you know, the, the founder of the company. Um, he was really impressed with you that I had asked questions, you know, at least uh that he hadn't been asked before. And I thought, I can't believe that because I would think he's been interviewed by everybody. So she pursued to um, to recruit me, but I kept saying no, no. And I said, well, I'm in school. I, I'm living in Berkeley. I I got to live in Berkeley. And, and about, I don't know, maybe two months, continuous, kind of like take you to lunch. Can I, you know, it was, lunch was a big thing, right? And I thought, maybe I should explore this. And so at that time, it, it was the, you know, the networking boom going into the connected world and we we're leaving AOL and going up to the internet, right? Remember AOL? Uh, and so it was a, an opportunity I explored. And then when I told her how much money I was making, she asked me, I remember my father saying, you never talk about politics, sex or religion, or how much money you make, or give your social security. I mean, just talk about basic and I'm thinking, thinking, well, that's really nervy. She's asking me how much money I'm making. And I told her and she laughed. And I thought, wow, maybe I'm not valued enough. UPS is at my door. And you're going to hear my dog, Bella Luna. I apologize. All good. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll, I'll edit some. My sidekick. You, you, you guys have like, you know, two-legged. I have a four-legged sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so opportunity I decided to take. And I was the opposite part of the world for me. This is a big transition. I went from being a reporter to going into a public relations department. And my first thought was, Oh, these are the people that are trying to sell me all day long. What do they know? Well, when I interviewed with the team, everybody that was there was former journalists. There was a couple of people that were from San Jose State that were communications majors. But for the most part, they were former journalists, current public, public relations specialists, and they were from all over the United States. You know, they weren't from Silicon Valley. They were from Boston. They were from New York. And so... It was really fascinating to me that these I could take my my skill set and apply it and reverse it, be on the other side. And I didn't felt that public relations actually picked me. I didn't actually pick it. But once I got in there, because the money was really good too, three, it was like <laughs> like three times my salary. I mean, you kind of you're gonna think about that, right? But what about and the cockroaches, Donna? Come on, that's rude. Oh, you're being, you're, that's you're left cheating left on them so already. Far behind. Rude. But you know, it was a great opportunity. I remember calling my father and I said, Dad, I have this opportunity and they want to pay me. It was a time I was a reporter and I'm making $34,000. And this company is going to pay me three times that. I don't know about you. The travel was good and everything, but this got real good. And the first, uh, I remember my first day at work, I had to go to Intel. And I had interviewed people at Intel for, for a number of years. But I actually had walked in with the founder of the company. And at the time, Andy Grover was the head of the company. And he noted me by first name. And the, and the, and the, <laughs> the president of the company was like, you know, Andy, like on a first name basis. <laughs> so that's when I realized, like, okay, this was the right thing to do. Because now I'm going to talk, I'm going to go to the other side and I'm going to really dig my heels. But I was a little intimidated as I might not seem like I would be intimidated, but 
I was just a little intimidated of these founders and, and super tech geek, you know, kind of um, corral of people. But once I found out, as you mentioned, Raj, I had to go in and have conversations and I needed to break things down. I didn't have to have a degree in neuroscience and tech or anything to have conversations. And in some ways, I had to bring them to the table, like we we're all at the same table, but I had to change the conversation. So, I mean, again, like, I, I, I there's just so much behind it because like, I feel like Donna, you know, because I know it's me. So I'm going to project like when I'm looking in the mirror, I don't see like me. But Donna, what I just heard there too is you did exactly what you've been doing your whole life. You went back and took your international exposure. You reframed your thought process in going home, which then trained you to go in like, I don't need to be a PhD in neuroscience. You guys have a burden of knowledge. You have one hammer and every, you know, everything's that nail. Stop, doc, stop. This person isn't telling here. They're not here. So you come in with a reframe and you drag their asses into reality not their head. So like, I, I mean, it's, it's been in there the whole time. It's amazing. And I think that's, what's so important for not even series A's and series B's. I mean, precedes what everybody going through it all, like you have to just remove. And again, my burden of knowledge always comes from, I, I, it's impaled an ego and the context is five physicians in my family. So our dinners at night, like the dog is throwing up. They're like, oh, it's, you know, blah, blah, just about, blah, blah. I was like, nope, the dog actually ate its own poop. Like, stop it. You can't diagnose this dog. It's not sick. <laughs> I love There's it. no ischemic bowel. It's nothing. It ate poop and it's Dr. throwing up. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, hey, doctor, doctors, doc, hey, doctor, 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 Mawad, chill out. The dog ate poop. <laughs> the dog ate poop. <laughs> but I mean, that, that's missed in the tech world, in the Silicon Valley. Hey, I'm Sequoia, you know, whatever you want to call it. And then it's like, hmm. I have a theory that I came up with. Um, I don't even know when I came up with it, but I come up with a lot of theories, but this is one of them. Um, ego engineering versus innovation. So, you know, when you go to pitches and accelerators and people pick, you know, pitch their products and stuff. And I sit there in scrutiny going, do we need that? Do I want that? Do I already have it? Right. And then I was like, realized, like, okay, okay, is this really you know, like, like innovation or is it ego engineered? And we see a lot of that in, in the technology sector. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think we need as consumers, not just as, you know, professionals, but as consumers, I always question it. Do I need it? Do I want it? Do I have it? Is it going to take over my life? I have a late adopter. As much as I like technology and innovation, I remember being resistant, as I mentioned earlier, like CDs. I remember being resistant to like Alexa and Siri and all these other women, like, you know, and whispering in my voice. And now I find, you know, it's used for some of sometimes. GPS, I like because I never get lost anymore. But I think we should question those things as, as consumers as well. No, I mean, a hundred percent. And even in, in, in the mood of rudimentary precede young fledgling founder, it's, it's, it's vitamin versus the pain pill. Who's actually going to pay for it? Like truly you can stroke your ego. There's a more expletive term for it. Um, but, but why, <laughs> what are yeah. we doing here? And then the pontific, you know, pontification about it. You're like, just that's too many words, <laughs> too many words, slow down. The dog Ate, it's poop. It's fine. Yeah. You know, like you don't have to over engineer it, but, and that's wild right. because then I always think, don't eat your own dog food. Right. Cause you take it to the next level. Don't eat your own dog food and your own poop. Um, anyway, I might steal that for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like, it's, it's pervasive. And I think it's tough. And then again, you get these, these, and, and who loses your, these blow up valuations for nothing. That's that ego innovation of like, oh, I just generated an AI toilet. You're like, what? why? Like, why did you make an AI toilet? Just so you could say we have blockchain in the toilet. And I'm like, stop it. Like you don't need to use buzzwords to then. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm, I don't know why I'm in a, in a bathroom mood today. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, I've seen so much of these, 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 these nomenclatures, these monikers that are getting dropped at so cheaply now skewing everything from people who have real businesses, VC capital's drying up. And now they're like, man, 
we should have listened we should have listened to Donna you know back you know one of my best experiences working in, in a tech company when I was working late and which was common and the janitors came in and I used to know like when the janitorial crew came in it's probably maybe time for me to leave but I actually got to know some of them right and I would talk to them about you know would they use this or what their thoughts were like they didn't know what they come they come in to do their job in and out and here I am crazy lady want to like interview them and see if they would you know want to try out a product and and it was it was a really great dialogue to to have because they were interested and so we just assume because they're janitorial help, they're not going to be adapting, you know, uh, in the latest headset or, you know, whatever at the, at the time, uh, you know, was working on, um, well, I, had, I worked on Palm and then I worked on BlackBerry and then I worked on, you know, kind of the evolution of things, but I was also in a lot of like, when I say hardware, hardware, and that's why, you know, I'm not afraid of hardware because I I worked on bridges and routers and gateways and server crap before, you know, it was cool. And and then and then I got this cool consumer, you know, software stuff later. But having conversations with people and, you know, outside of your own discipline is, is so important. So we talk a lot about ESG in the workplace within corporations. And if you watch The Office that the you know the sitcom it's so politically incorrect that most of the, the scenes i watched it in a holiday season with my daughter and she says how did this show ever get on tv and i said well it's before he has you know, all this stuff right it's right up there with archie bunker and other shows in the past but i think it's really important to be conscious and aware and and telling our story and who we are. And, and in the process of writing a book, one of my chapters is called, You Are Not Your Zip Code. Because that means that you actually have freedom to move around, to explore, and have, be curious and discover. And just because you grew up in one place, I grew up in you know, zip code in, in, the, in the East Foothills of Silicon Valley. I went to New York City as a totally different zip code and zip codes should push us out of our comfort zone and they should also welcome us at the same time of new knowledge and, and information and so that particular chapter to me is very enduring because I, I had to step back and, and think about that and what that meant and and so you can be whatever zip code you want to be just make it the truth and that's been a that's been amplified at you know in in magnitudes of multiples with covid because it's now it's digital borderless like i remember a friend of mine was saying like i'd say to like at the prime and the, the primacy of it is like clubhouse turned in like it was just vcs walking around there in shorts and flip-flops it wasn't like the kind of like boom 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 so he's like it was a digital borderless so it's really what changed you could be in like you said sorry what happened to club is anybody using it now that's and that's another point like no what was the point of that vitamin? We were all told to go in, hang out with the cool kids. And then the cool kids all went off to something else because nobody else was showing up. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm sure they raised $5 billion. <laughs> you know, I have worked with companies with two guys and no dog or, or a couple of two guys, a girl and a cat because they couldn't afford a dog. And... <laughs> And gone through that process of, you know, concept to execution to market. Very frugal. Yeah. And it's one of the things that I mentioned earlier is I try to help my clients spend the money like it's in their pocket is because I now know the, sh the, you know, the shortest route to destination and, and to be able to like I, I always, you know, with my, our media, I say there's a nifty 50. Those are like, you know, it's a big, longer targeted list of people you want to talk to. But there's my dirty dozen. And where and the dirty dozen is where, like, I swear, I, I don't have much time in launching a company like a, an electric motorcycle company that I work with. I had 10 days to CES. They called me. It was holiday season. I almost fell off my chair. And they said, because I was looking for an EV client. I manifested it, Raj. I'm like, I want this. I want an EV client. And I want it on two wheels. And got it. Had a, a few after that. But they said, I said, CES 2021. And they said, C C CES 2020. That was. I'm like, that's in 10 days. And they said, 
Yep. And I said, okay, I'm your girl. I can do it. I knew who to call. I knew what analysts to call. I knew what analysts talked to what media and I knew what media would directly would to, to write. And, and so that's a template and a formula, you know, that, that over and over and over and over and again, and, and, and kind of replicating that. But where did that and, go? And, where did and it putting go? People, what's that? Where did it go, Donna? Where did the like, all right, I got to call up my Jim Brown. Like, we got to go to work. We got to invade the cast. Like, where the? No, no, no. Let me do a mass hire. Oh, we miss numbers. Let me do a mass fire. Oh, wait, actually, before you leave, I need to rehire you because I'm an idiot. Oh, yeah. Enough. I'm I'm not even old and I'm tired of it. <laughs> It's hard. So, it's really well, hard. I was a little sad the last couple of weeks. In, in Silicon Valley, um, there was just some crazy that was happening. And it's been in my mind. Uh, Elon Musk tweeting, you know, about San Francisco and the, everybody who's, you know, going to be killed in the streets and blah, blah, blah. And it was it was a little ludicrous. But I had to stand back and look at it because I, I actually, like, when I look talk about ego engineering and innovation, I look at Elon and he's a lot of contributed a lot. But I like the Elon that actually is like looking up at space as a wonderkin and thinking, wow, that's amazing. Look what we just did. Not the one who's tweeting and, and tearing down the Silicon Valley, because those of us that are really involved in the, in the Silicon Valley and, and the Gulch or wherever the Valley may be, you know, we, we live it. And there are things that socially, you know, could change, but it ended up being like this social profiling and, and like reputation management kind of in defense of, you know, of Silicon Valley and in San Francisco, that things need to change. But I was, I was kind of, I was embarrassed for him that he went, took it too far. And it, and it was the, I would go into meetings and people were down. They were upset. It was a tragic situation. It happened. And then all the stuff, the drama is coming out unfolding that is, is, it's gotten weirder, but a really good friend of mine, Sam Springer, Liz, in, in, in the East Bay, and he operates a, a, an amazing public affairs business. He is the crisis guy. If I need to put out a crisis, I can do a crisis plan. But he's the guy that basically defended the San Francisco Zoo. I don't know if you remember this situation when the teenage kids that went drunk on Christmas Day went in and jumped in the tiger pit, and they were killed. Well, guess what happens? You jump into a tiger pit, you're probably not going to make it. So he worked in you know, reputation with the San Francisco Zoo and the city and those things. He's also the one you call in if you actually have a major product issue or, you know, reputation management with an executive stuff. He's brilliant. It's not in what he does is real. Like he really gets, you know, down to the core facts and stuff. Sam, ironically, has been in this industry for as many, as long, longer than I have been. His office is the same residence where the person who, you know, who was arrested for the murder. And I, he was quoted in the San Francisco Chronicle and about you know, the city's reputation and you know preservation of that. But I, I had to text him. I said, Sam, I said, you must be really happy that all the news trucks in the San Francisco Bay Area are outside your business office right now. Because he his business work. And I said, I said, and he says, yeah, wouldn't you think? He goes, the public... You know, the public affairs, you know, crisis communications, you know, building is basically in lockdown right now. I, mean, I can't, you know, can do my job. But what I what I thought was really interesting is how full circle and how well can, closely connected we are to think, things, right? We are all in, you know, within proximity of similar, you know, zip codes. And we are somehow all connected. And it's like you said, Kevin Bacon theory or whatever you want. But at the end of the day, I think that we have a responsibility as professionals and, and, and as citizens to just be kind. And that's what the part that really annoyed me about these worthless tweets. I don't use Twitter anywhere. Not even before that. It's just that, does it really matter? We're gonna does spin? it help? Does it fucking help? Yeah, if we're gonna, is it going to help us in five years? And let's not spend five minutes on it. Yeah, and I wow. think, yeah, I think that's a good one. Yeah, I think why I'm so like kind of like fidgety right now is like, honestly, I feel it too. I just do. I'm from Texas, so I'm from the South. I have never seen us so fractured 
so fra- there used to be some semblance of bipartisan ah, i hate you i hate you but let's like and i don't care about politics just like you know i won't talk zip codes about, but i'm like this this is stupid this is stupid and and i'm not a smart person and i could see it's stupid it's yeah well and it was it's like really psych- depressing i won't lie yeah so i was like morale booster back a few yeah weeks- sorry <laughs> <laughs> we're back but no because I so the dog ate its poop right guys <laughs> i'm defending the, the the quote the industry of silicon valley tech and you know, it's like it's it's last eyes right it goes you know started you know in the roots of in san jose palo alto but it's last eyes all the way to san francisco and then we have pockets in seattle and all these other tech things areas right but i just think it it I personally offended when something like that happens because I know that there's just so many great people that are working really hard um, to to um, you know the fifth largest economy in the world. Agriculture to me is I, I mean I'll be totally transparent. Agriculture and farming. When I go to the Salinas Valley, I put my hands up. To me, it is more thrilling to drive through Salinas Valley and see the heartland and all the and, and the agriculture that we have. More exciting than going to San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge. You know why? Because that is like literally down to the soil and to the baseline of the of the you know the fertilization and the and of who we are. This Silicon Valley has a mystique. If you got to go back to the roots of like, we put concrete on top of some of the most fertile valley. And then we put a, put a slap a label and we call it Company Apple. And then we create another company and we call it, you know, better, whatever. But it's like, I feel in, in a lot of ways, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm harvesting new crops, <laughs> working with my, my clients and building their stories. But there's a lot of harvesting that happens, particularly in the sales side and in, in the marketing side of things. And, and so looking at those those parallels is if I was from someplace else, I'm curious, Raj, your perspective coming from Texas to the valley and is the, do you, I see the equal, you know, agriculture being significantly as important as, as innovation and technology. And somehow in between, there's people get left behind. Not everybody's making a deep six-figure salary, people. Come on, just a little reality there. Then we hit pandemic, the service industry was hit really hard. And the agriculture industry was hit really hard. So when I hear tech people complaining that they're not going to get their lunches and their food programs and stuff, I'm like, Nobody ever paid for my groceries. <laughs> Going back to being in my 20s and my 30s, you know, in my roots of my of my PR career, a, a journalism career before PR. No one bought my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I knew where every happy hour in town was where you can get free hors d'oeuvres, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's it? And- God, I'm, today is just like a dark day. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but it's so funny you just said that, Don. And what I heard in my again, I just take words in and whatever hits my brain. It's like, how did they get to that point? How, not privileged. I'm going to say words from because I'm from Texas. Just blame it on that. Like, hey, pay for my lunch, pay for my coffee. How did they get to that privilege? Technology. Sorry. And now it's like, but I'm supporting technology. So like, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting feedback loop. It's like, man, we are ruining some shit. We are ruining some shit with this stuff, but I got to support it. But then it's like the, how do I support it? The right. And uh, the Too altruistic, who's the altruistic, what's his name? The altruistic, the Googler. Uh, he wants uh, the, the internet to be. And, uh, like uh, Sir, Sergey. No, not Sergey, but like he wants the internet to be used altruistically, like for the right. He's a big, kind of a funny name. I think it's just fun, because like my point is like, it comes to me like, yeah, it's coming. It is coming. It might've ruined this. It might've ruined the past. It might, you know, but it's coming. So somebody's got to fight the good fight or, or somebody's got to get in there the right way because it's, it's going to come. I can pretend like it's not. I can I can live in the past and be all, oh, hey, woe is me, my, my dog. Where are the Powerpuff Girls when you need them? That's all I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that guy? Well, but you know, it's true because I see with my with my own kids growing up, and every parent's had this the phone wars, right? Yep. And the classroom teachers having to deal with that. 
you know, it's like, and, and like, think about it. We went to school, elementary school, probably for you, middle school, definitely high school and college for me without Google, without being able to have access to the digital world and stuff. Gen X is and the telling of the baby boomers didn't have this. And so the generation growing up and under, under C, I don't know. I, I, I'm beginning to think with the ESG world we're living in, people are, are going back to like, oh, I, I care about humanity. I, everything needs to be meaningful. But we also have to be really careful. There's a blend. I think we all need to be socially responsible. You look at futurists. Like I love uh, uh, Faith Popcorn. I love that saying the name, but you know, she's a futurist and, and been writing about this for years about the social evolution of people. My daughter's a sociology major. And, and so she was the opposite. She goes, mom, she goes, my brother can go to business and do whatever he wants. But I want to do, I want to save the world. So my joke was always, he's going to save in the next designer cell. She's going to save the world. And I was looking at our class studies and I said, you know, Valentina, I think that you need to take an art class, art appreciation, art history class. Why do I want to do that? I said, well, because you're, I said, I'm surprised it's not part of the social sociology curriculum. I said, because it is known historically over time, and I used the pandemic as an example. I said, I'm hoping out of the pandemic, we get some great art. We get some great fashion. And I don't know if you look at fashion lately, but the fashion runway shows are just ridiculous. I look like we're in these big cocoon balloon <laughs> things. And, and I said, but so, you know, society and it reflects the sign of the times. And so if you look at the Renaissance and what was happening then. If you look at the, in the in the twenties, you look at you know the sixties, and then you get into the you know where you know, all these different eras. So she kind of thought it was a, a bad idea, but eventually she said, "Okay, I'm going to talk to you know." She talked to her her advisor, and they said, "Oh yeah, you know, you could take that as an elective." Turns out one of her most favorite classes because she did can make the connection of art and society. And I took her, I drove her around San Jose and I said, look at this mural. Who do you think painted this mural? What does this mural express in the community? Let's go to a different neighborhood. What's expressive over here, right? And I even told, you know, tagging. I'm like, that's an expression, right? That's a sign of the times, right? You see homeless people, that's another expression, right? So anyway, my point is that you can't, I, we can't live with, I mean, a lot of people will live with blinders, but I feel the more knowledge that I have and the more social understanding that I have, and not just, you know, the, the what's coming out of some tech manual, the more I can be a better service in my industry to my clients and to the, the customer. Today, I was on a call. It was really funny. And it's a market segment that, you know, I was gonna say it's a it's a tracking market for tracking you know devices and things, and everybody immediately shows the tracking tag you know with the the keys because people lose their keys all the time, you lose your keys lose your mind right it's like lose your keys lose your phone. Well, if you remember when GoPro first came out, they were really clever. They put that camera on a turtle right, and we all paid attention. It's like oh do I need that? Roomba came out and what do they do? a cat on the, you know, on the Roomba and it caught our attention. Like, why are we still voting, showing a, a key and a tracker? Like, I know when my kids were little, if they lost their blanket, they'd scream. So I'm thinking, put it on a baby blanket, right? <laughs> you know, put it on your dog and do other things that you can put it on. But I, I, I kind of just had to expand, you know, the conversation or start that conversation and shake it up. Can we look beyond that, Right. If we look at autonomous cars, autonomous technology as an example, and I've worked in numerous companies in that, in that category, is I had to talk to not just the companies who are making the technology, but companies that could apply it. So in aviation, automotive, right, um, aerospace, talk to scientists and doctors that actually, you know, in the research lab, is it safe? Should I be, but should I be concerned? Like, would you be in an autonomous car? And it's interesting to hear, you know, the, the array of responses that I got. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Schultz out of Yale was fascinating to talk to because he owns a Tesla, but he drives it with great caution because he doesn't necessarily trust the technology. He trusts the idea of autonomous, but he doesn't trust the technology yet. He doesn't think we're there. 
And I think that that's one of the things that we should be, it doesn't make any difference if you're in pharmaceutical, if you're a tech or other agriculture, different market segments, we should always ask those questions. I almost got hit by one of those Google cars a couple of days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if, <laughs> hopefully it didn't have the camera on top <laughs> so yeah, it'd be sure forever <laughs> i think that's just super interesting because because so when i was running my fund um i was pretty good i, I was pretty good and, and but i was super hyper focused on some really esoteric stuff really weird stuff so people would ask me like ah that's 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 a twofold people ask me like so what do you think about apple and i'm like i no idea they're like you run a hedge fund. I was like, yep. They're like, and you don't know, like, what do you think about Apple? I was like, I don't know. I, I have no idea. I don't touch equities. So like my ego wasn't there. I had to be like, no, I don't know that. Here's my lane. And, and I get it. I don't, I think we're missing that, but I think it came because I was pretty good at what I did because I've studied history. I'm a curious person. I think that's something you said as well, which seems to be an underlying thing that Seth and I always hear on anybody on this show. It's curious 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 and so like i think that's an underlying thread which i love but i would i would study history and i'd understand what changes itself did uh, monetary and fiscal policy so understanding fx derivatives you know currencies and all that stuff so it's like cool in history if this changed or if this country went to war how would this change and blah 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 blah, blah. so I, I and then i remembered like when did that because it's psychological and philosophical, but it also it comes to, to actual work. When did that fabric start to tear? Industrial revolution took me away from my dad on the farm. It took daughters away from the to go work and this and build and whatnot. We lost that family dynamic. We've lost that unity. And it's so funny. Again, technology is the one that disrupted the family. I mean, again, I'm being very broad brush here, but like I didn't work on the farm with my dad anymore. I didn't come up and sundown and sundown, which then tore the fabric. And then could people be like, oh, that's almost low key or you know, low work unless you're in technology. So it's it's interesting if you go back into history and understand how much it can help you for the front side of it, but they just don't want to. Yeah. I was working with an electric tractor company for the last three years, and it was really interesting to literally go back into the field and on ranches and farmers and talk about how challenging difficult it is for them to make a living. And we're talking generations, four or five generations of farmers, and it's the family business, and they're not able to make a living. So what do they do? They they need to innovate. They need to uh, look at new technologies. They, they would a, a staff a, a staffing you know employment uh, problem. They have climate change. They got the, you know in California with fires and the and the drought, and then you, then when the COVID comes. I mean they were hit really hard. And and so you look at that and oh, I know, I'm sorry, but if you're sitting in a cubicle at some major publicly traded company, stop complaining about not having when their entire agriculture industry was so affected in the food that is delivered and comes to our table. Um, stop, I don't know, I'm just gonna use the word, it's entitled, selfish, whatever. I don't know, we could come up with a new word today. It's funny too, especially because you're at PR and you hit on something. Uh, I traded, I, I cleared a lot of commodity derivatives. So I'm sure you remember in 11 when Corzine was at MF Global. So I had quite a bit of money locked up at MF Global when it went bankrupt uh, when because he was a trading partner of ours. And a lot of people like, oh, these traders like, oh man, you know, I lost my money. These are grain silos that hedge the crops of these farm. Like they've lost their lives. Like people don't understand if it's in that cubicle, like thought process, like you're saying, it's like, what about me? And it's hitting my wallet. But the reality is that commodity derivatives on grain before technology, we're making sure that their cattle didn't die. We're making sure that they had that generational farming and we've bastardized it through technology. So like, it's so interesting to see that. And then it's coming full circle. EV Maybe we should all st start thinking like farmers. Bill Gates isn't picking up stuff for fun. You need to plant seeds, water them, nurture. <laughs> Weird. Well, you know, it's interesting because you're in the finance sector. And I remember another pivot for me uh, is after working and, and doing a bunch of startup companies, a reporter, corporate side, publicly traded companies. And then I did four IPOs and then 
I took I, the fifth one would have been a, a great one. It was a storage company, but unfortunately, after working there for six weeks, they lost their funding. So there were 300 people let go. I was called in to write ready for this. I love this. I was brought in to tell them, you know, what was happening, the unfortunate news, and I needed to write the com corporate communication language and everything for the layoff that was to happen, which included myself. So I got to read myself my own letter. <laughs> and then I uh, got a six week severance package, which technically the company really didn't owe me. I'd only been there six weeks. So I thought they were actually being fairly generous to give me you know a package but i remember walking to my car 2002 it wasn't a really great time to be you know going out there freelancing in the world 2001 i had a lot of friends that lost their houses and stuff you know through the all the the rate the craziness that was happening uh with interest rates and stuff and i remember walking to my car and i put the severance check and i think i better go to the bank and cash it because what if it doesn't you know but it wasn't clear. And I had a $5 bill in there. I didn't carry much cash in my purse in general. And I had a $5 bill. I had a Starbucks card. I get in the car and I look at the gas gauge and I had a half ticket gas. And I had just this moment going, okay, I'm a pilot. The windshield is much bigger than the rear view mirror. <laughs> I'm just going to keep, I'm going to drive right oh, now. I love that. I'm driving right now to the business office on first street in San Jose, and I'm going to get myself a license and on my way to get the business license. Talk about being thrown into like the, the, the oven here. I call three people, a venture capitalist friend, my old employer, whose job I didn't really need to leave. I was, you know, it was really good, but I, I was timed. I wanted a new opportunity and an editor. By the time I got to the business office, the three people that I thought would be my Kevin Baker and equivalent all had something for me to do. And I basically it's, called it's, and said, It randomly happens to you, Donna. It's, it's it totally did. random. <laughs> it is totally <laughs> random, my dear. <laughs> By sheer happenstance, shit happens for you, girl. I, I didn't say, I'm unemployed. I'm unemployable. I said, Hi, this is Donna. I'm a consultant now, and I wanted to see if you might have talked to you about some, like, right? I just literally made a shit. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I went to the business license office and I look at this massive manifesto, and I see auto mechanics, nail shops, hair, you know, all these different things. And I don't see anything that says public relations. I don't see anything that says marketing. I'm like, I'm like, Oh, how do I do this? I didn't know. They really discovered this. So I asked a woman. She goes, "Well, you would fall other under consultancy." And I'm like, "And I just says, which you know, do you get to use your real name, fictitious name?" And I said, "No, I'm just going to use my name." And by the time I got home, I went from five dollars in my pocket and this six week check to fifteen thousand in projects. By the time I woke up the next day, it was fifty thousand dollars in projects. And I went, "Yes," and I never looked back. Because that rear view mirror is too small. <laughs> that is awesome. That, awesome. I, like, Seth, I got, I honestly, it happen. <laughs> I got nothing. Like, I literally, <laughs> like, uh, no, are that's... you hiring? <laughs> <laughs> so, there you go. That's, that's, that's been the last 15 years. You know what? Uh, fuck, screw that. Are you adopting? <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for somebody. I actually adopted my kids. I, I adopted my kids from from Russia, um, and that was an interesting experience because I was running a business, and then like literally three years later, I'm like, hey, let's you know stop a couple of kids. I do infants, you know, startups all the time. Let's do like a toddler startup. Uh, no, they but, go for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the the first. The first uh, couple of months was like a tsunami, right? Because you you go from like being a professional and and uh, you know not really having that response. Not that I wasn't responsible at that level of responsibility being a parent, and all of a sudden you have siblings, two and a half and four, and 
you know, they talk and they, they, they're very active and they speak another language and I needed to brush up my Russian and, and fortunately I started speaking English faster than my Russian and, and all these things. And I remember my brother saying, you never do anything that's not complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I had my team at the time were all women. And they and, I, and because of the fallout of two, what's happening after the dot, dot com bubble, I was able to start my first five employees where women they were stay at home and could work you know with their kids, but they they were they wanted some mental stimulation, and so they could work fifteen you know twenty hours you know not a week you know sometimes a month, and then as their kids got older, they start taking on more hours, and so. We had a joke at one point, LMGPR stood for Loving Mother's Good PR, but it really is leadership, momentum, and growth. But they were actually a key part of the fabric of my success of doing, you know, duality now as, as I, my kids never felt that I wasn't accessible or available. I mean, I took them to school. I picked them up. I was out after school. It gave me, having a business gave me more flexibility than the corporate world. And I think that's one of the things that I liked about the pandemic is I saw men now going into that role of, of, of my clients, you know, having their kids sit on their laps or their dogs and stuff. And it kind of humanized and, you know, and, and equalized things in some regard, which I thought was cool. Wow, that's that, that's that, Roger, that, tomorrow. The, the lessons like, in perspective. Uh, wow. And I'm over here. So I have a Seth, did you ever meet Mary Kay? Um, I haven't, but I, I know who she is. So I had a business and you know, very good friend. And, and honestly, she remind like, you guys are lockstep. And I was like, what, a, but like, what am I, why? So she communications, but she was in Berkeley, worked for the city of Berkeley, you know, public information officer, city manager officer. Now she's doing, she's vice president at Wusha, her sunshine communications. And she makes shit happen, Donna. And she's like, she's basically your sister because she's, she's a ba. She's a ba. She's a wolf. She like she sharpens her teeth, and like, but I think like you in a perfect nutshell, Donna was you just dropped it. It was like you. It's just awesome. It's like oh, I'm gonna brush up on my Russian. It's not like oh shit, I gotta go learn Russian. Of course, Donna's like <laughs> nah, man, I gotta just actually brush up. Hold on, real quick. Yeah, I'm good. Like that's like <laughs> perfectly you in a nutshell. It's like. I got to brush up on my Russian daughter. Well, if I, <laughs> but I told you what's uh, actually, I'll tell you what's on my desk, right? What, what I have, I'm looking at it. I have a uh, Richard Avedon advertising book, like how to advertise and promote. I have yep. Andy Warhol, Polaroids, 1958 to 1987. Okay. Bob Dylan songbook. I have the Prince songbook. I have a Dare to Launch, which was a guest on my podcast, a great book for starts, not for her. Uh, I have a how to dust up on your your uh, Italian, and then I have uh, Salvador Dali, and then it's a bunch of like books of people that I'm. You know, oh, and I have my Dr. Seuss Green Eggs and Ham. But this is <laughs> you're her spirit animal, and you are because you have the yin and the yang, the eclectic mix of the heart of the soft, the 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 physics and the psychology. The and this is how you win. It's not tech tech build build feature feature focus focus founder. It's not. You have to sell. You have to know psycho demographics like. Well, this is burn you out. I mean, that was like my, I will say, I, I felt that the, when, when I, the storage company shut down, it was actually a door. I'm, I mean, I mean, very symbolic. The door flew open for me, like it just swung open. And I think we have to look for those opportunities in our life personally, but I don't have my professional life dictate who I am. I am not my my zip code. I am many zip codes, right? Of who I am. And I happen to reside back in, in proximity, not too far from the zip code I grew up, but I am many zip codes. And the, the title of my book is you're gonna laugh. Holy shit, I am many dip, zip codes, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Five dollars and a half a tank of gas. How to create unlimited stories for entrepreneurs, geeks, and divas. That's the book. Wow. Because the story or the narrative in which we all need to create for ourselves isn't just for innovators and tech. That's my world I live in. But it, I could go to a, a family mom and pop restaurant, grocery store, uh, hairdresser, 
and help them create. And I do this all the time for people I meet. I just like, let me help you. <laughs> I was talking to a to a, a a roofing company and family business, three generations. And he said, oh, we got Instagram and all stuff. And he shows, he was all excited. And I looked up and I said, well, you know, I said, you have a, you have a really, you know, solid, you know, trusted business and you have a lot of loyal customers that you don't put a roof on a house what, every 10, 20 years, right? Depending on that and where you live, what part of the country. I said, but what you're really about is that is the you're you're putting a you're building the structure where memories and moments and things happen. Your child's first steps, high school, you know, proms, graduations, weddings, funerals. So the roof over one's head symbolically is more than just a roof from a roofing company. So I just gave him some tips and things, and he kind of looked at me like, wow, I never thought, like, how do you make up this? <laughs> but it doesn't really make any difference. It's just looking, I mean, I, I have people call me and they say, I don't think this is in your, in your color well. And I'm like, and they're like, try me. And then I, and then they hear it, you know, what they're selling and all that. I got that one, the electric tractor company. I got that from um, the first 3D printed chassis. I didn't know anything about car chassis, but I needed to take the story and make it the first motorcycle helmet with the eyes in the back of your head. I think that's when I met you, yep. the, you know, <laughs> basically bringing this really cool tech and putting it in an application, augmented reality, but for an industrial headset, it didn't exist. So I think one of the things that I love about what I do is when I is finding uh, ideas, idea makers and shapers that also believe what I do, which is imagine the possibility. I, but I also say no a lot too. A Spectre gadget comes in and shows me like all the cool stuff in his jacket. You know that movie with Matthew Broderick? I watched the Goonies the other night, by the way. It was so funny. I was like, oh, this happened in the truffle movie. shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> and I just like, no, nah, I don't need that. No, nah, who wants that? I don't need that. Go to CES. You see a lot of that. And I'm like, nope, don't want it. Don't want it. But I had to be really, really discriminating, in, in, you know, in, in, and discriminating, sorry, and what I want to work on because I I can now choose. I worked really hard in my career and I had to say yes a lot, but I I it's okay to say no. And and I also want to tell you, you know, it's like when I talk to I work with a lot of industrial designers and engineers and um electric electrical, you know, um like Mighty Studios and Spanner, you know, are great engineering firms that they're the they're the people that are behind like the Apple products and the Beat products and the, you know, the Samsung products, that's all done in-house people, <laughs> you know? So these, these engineering firms are amazing to work with. And sometimes I'll call them and I say, I don't know. What do you think about, you know, this artificial, I'm making this up, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, you know, blender, do we need it? And they're like, nah, we don't need it. But are they working on something that's, you know, similar? But I think we, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say no when you go shopping too. Particular, I got, I got another, another, I don't know, UC Berkeley, like, you know, speaker's corner here. <laughs> Fast fashion. Fast fashion is another area that I particularly watch a lot. I interviewed somebody on my podcast about fast fashion. And I wasn't aware that as individuals, how much we contribute to the landfill. And I got it. I knew it was a lot, but I didn't realize that the number was so extraordinarily big. And I we felt suck. extraordinarily small and kind of yeah. stupid, to be honest. And I think being, again, being aware, right? What happens out of the country, what happens at somebody else's, you know, offshore. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember, but um, in the late 80s, a lot of the technology companies, particular hardware companies, uh, had to stand up and take responsibility for not offshoring other crap that they weren't using. If you haven't been to India or to parts of other parts of the world where you see battery graveyards, that concerns me. 
concerns me for the health of the people that are doing it, but it also concerns me. This is where I, 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 I love the idea of electrification and green, but what, how are we going to solve the, the democratization of the, the, you know, of the batteries and how are we going to dispose? If we're not thinking about that, I don't care what kind of EV car you drive, you should be thinking about that because the manufacturing and the disposable of that battery is more hazardous than the carbon. Well, and let's close that feedback loop because you're so right and you nailed it. And that's why your job is so important. It really is because we got to say our nose. We got to be realistic. We got to think about, okay, first they're stripping the mines. First they're trying to get their cobalt. Then they're going to like, let's be realistic. Everybody wanted to maybe vilify nuclear, but done in the right way, the buy waste might be, but you have to have the, the marketing. You have to have the PR. You have to be like, listen, we get Chernobyl sucked. We get it. But here's the opportunity cost of blah, 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 blah. And people can't just pretend that, again, they want to say the word blockchain and be you know, virtue signaling when reality is at stake here. But you have a different framing of it. And I'm sure it's gotten you in trouble. Not in trouble. Maybe it's got uh, some doors closed. And you don't you know, want to be in those doors, probably. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. To say you, you have to, yeah, you, it's it's a tough love, you know, tougher love. I said earlier, <laughs> I think, you know, I, I've worked in blockchain too. And the thing that I do like about blockchain in certain markets, like healthcare, pharmaceutical, Absolutely. it makes total sense. Food industry, I do care about where the food I eat came from and the source. And we, we stop doing Nasty things in the in, in preparation and uh, of food. food, every virus that we've had that and the pandemic, you know, included was either food or animal contamination. Back to agriculture. We're not good, care, we're not good caretakers. Just back to. We really suck at it. So, <laughs> when it comes to uh, when it comes to you know organic. I, I personally, I have my own garden. I grow a lot of my own vegetables and I share. How do I have time for this? I make time for it. Yeah. It's a priority for me. Priority. People say, oh, how do you have time? It's not that hard to grow a tomato. And you also will appreciate even more the farmer who's put their back into it and the and the, and the field workers that, I mean, I, I, I think I got a dozen strawberries Last year, my strawberry plants got kept fighting the squirrels. Squirrels really enjoyed it, but it really Whoa. makes you humble and appreciate those that are actually doing these labor-intensive jobs. That's There's scale. a reason why agriculture yeah. is going to go up. Most of the most of the water from the recent, you know, flash floods and stuff that we had did not feed the fields. No. It, it, the drainage went elsewhere, so we're not out of that yet, and we should be aware, you know, these these the fires and the rain and I mean all these different things that California particularly has been dealing with the agriculture market segment keeps getting hit again and again and again. And if anything keeps me up, I think about those types of things is how do we actually just be not better. I didn't say just be better humans. <laughs> um, right. I think we could all use use uh, that kind of perspective. <laughs> um, so Donna, I'd love to, I mean, you mentioned you work with over 500 startups at different stages. Um, and we're, we're unfortunately approaching the end of the episode, but <clears throat> for the viewers, right? Like the, most of our viewers are like pre-seed, seed, some series A kind of companies who maybe PR and communications are at the, at the end of their, kind of a task sheet. Um, I'd love to first off hear like a, a quick summary about the kinds of companies that you work with. And then at what stage you you actually believe, not only do you provide the most value, but then also where you believe that the startup should, or founders should be thinking about bringing on somebody like you. And, yeah, and maybe, and maybe Donna, because I think that's so important, but maybe if you could say, while you're at the, at a different part, maybe let the founders know, even at pre-seed, they should be thinking of something. Again, maybe not engaging, you know, but I'm saying like, because I feel like it's got to be in there somewhere. Obviously, there's opportunity costs, burn, all that stuff. But I love what Seth was saying. But at some point, they should think about it even in ideation. 
Yeah. Yeah. You can't just innovate to innovate. I mean, I think that's great for a lab. If you have the luxury of working uh, and, and, and my, co my podcast before it happened show, I created it because I had access to some really great, you know, scientists and innovators. And there were people that I was working with or just people I just I met through, you know, networking. And I think, wow, that's really cool. I don't want to tell the help tell these stories. But the companies that I work with are typically in two camps. They call I call them, you know, in smaller early stage companies in emerging markets that are either privately funded or just got their a, a funding. I work with them in what I call a jumpstart program, which is the affordable, you know, program that basically over a three month period, I'm going to write their their story. I'm going to write their 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 pitch. I'm going to get them some quick editorial so that they have something to walk into the venture capitalist with, and get them, you know. And everyone wants tech crunch. I'm like, oh, let's think bigger than that. And I I spoil them sometimes. I say, oh, you know, I'm going to get you the Wall Street Journal. I'm going to get you in the New York Times, and I'm going to get you, you know, places that their market needs to be. And so I, I'm always excited to work with them because. Oftentimes they only work with me for 90 days and it's their spins, not big, you know, and I'll just give a number. It's like $15,000 over a three month period is not a big spin, but then guess what? They keep me informed. I kind of mentor them along the way. They call me, I give them, I give them, you know, guidelines, do introductions where I can. And then when they get the money, they typically will call me back. So the, that's basically using jumpstarting your your market presence and just pushing yourself catapulting you out into the market and so that you can get exposure. If you are funded already and you have a product and it's and it's in full development and it's going out, typically the stage I work in is like six months before launch because that's where the market analyst and the influential, you know, I'm going to call influencers that uh, people, every category has an influence. And I don't mean social media influencers. I mean, you know, people that are you know, book authors or, um, or, or just evangelists, themselves. you know, that I can leverage into these conversations and then the media. I have a really big article coming out in Wired Magazine for a client I've been working with for three years. Oftentimes people say, oh, I want to be in the cover of like Forbes. I want to be in the cover of you know, Business Week and I want to be in Wired. I'm like, well, let me tell you how you're going to get there because you're not going to get there if you're in my jumpstart category because you have a, you don't you don't have the the revenue you don't have the market you know um you know your own customer set you just you haven't you haven't earned it sorry you're not entitled to it there's no entitlement in pr so i get to say that a lot too raj which is fun so being able to work with the early stage companies and help them get to that level that they can get their funding and then continue to work and then the, you know when they get to the next phase which is being able to work with them, you know, more on a retainer base. It's really not about a retainer or a program. It's about the engagement and the trust that my clients have working with me. And that's why I have a lot of clients that come back to me multiple times. Right now, I have a client who's also on two boards that I work with. And so there's a lot of trust in the network that I, you know, that, that, People know when LMGPR comes into the room is we're going to be a chamomile tea. We're going to listen. But at the same time, we're going to be a little bit of an espresso because our job is to help you be better at what you, what you do. Amazon's here. <laughs> so anybody who wants to, you know, explore, jumpstart, early stage, or thinking about creating a company, the entrepreneurship, not to, you know, I love chatting with entrepreneurs. I, I have a couple of conversations going on right now. People probably won't be ready to hire me for another two years. And that's fine. I, I But I give them the guidance that they need and trust that I'm not just asking them to write a check. It's not about writing a check. It's an, it's it's an engagement, and then we you know really ultimately become, you know, a family in a sense. You know, so I guess, and I personally take a lot of, uh, when when my clients get to a point where they're going to be acquired, or they're going to you know they're going to bring everything in house. I there's like sending your kid off to college or to kindergarten for the first time. It's like oh there goes another one. And so that process of, of letting go is another, you know, thing that I that I had to learn over the years is I 
it's it is business, but I do take you know the relationships I create and create you know to very you know very they're very important to me. So I, I guess in some ways, Raj, I have been adopted <laughs> a lot, and I adopt back. <laughs> And then, um, uh, do you do you fit yourself in particular kind of industries or particular kinds of companies, or do you like working across the spectrum? Yeah, well, be, on the B two B side, it's a lot of data center infrastructure right now. Um, think hydropower data centers and artificial intelligence data centers, cybersecurity, pretty much anything in the data center, uh, hardware, software, cloud, um, all that. Uh, a lot of that technology and innovation that was once in the data center or in aerospace is now in our car and our home. So that's where my entree into taking privacy and security or uh, artificial intelligence or robotics. So I work with robotics companies. I work with artificial intelligence, work with transportation, two wheels, four wheels, things that fly. Um, and as a pilot, I really like to work with things that fly. I got my first one. And then on the consumer electronics side, the B2C side, everything over the years from, you know, gaming to smart devices and and uh, wellness and wearables and tracking devices and uh, and things that for baby monitoring and health. The one thing that I don't like to do, and I, as I do a big I don't like to do pre-order campaigns, you know, I, I don't, any of those, those are just... Unfortunately, um, we did a lot in a period, and we all we all were probably you know customers and investors in those things. But uh, I'm not a big fan of you know that particular segment. I like to help our clients really get real money that is going to help them you know help them kind of go the distance. But things that excite me most right now are probably robotics, artificial intelligence, and and transportation, transformative. You know, I kind of put everything into an emerging tech bucket. Um, if it's not mass, uh, you know, if, if the Gartner Group has been covering it for the last five years, I'm probably not that interested. But if if uh, Parks and Associates and, F and Frost and Sullivan are, and, are just beginning to cover and create a category, then I want to be part of that because I want to help, you know, these these innovations become categories. Hmm. Oh, that's amazing. And then. Um, because we we weren't really able to to skim through it, but your favorite companies that you worked with over the last uh, for, since My LMG. Favorite. Wow, you know I, I worked. I think that there's a couple. Uh, Nightscope Robotics, uh, based in the Valley, is a company that's focused on crime fighting and and basically helping law enforcement reduce crime. Um, robots, you know, they basically were the founders. Um, William Santana Lee and Stacey Jean Stevens created it based on the Sandy Hook shootings. We still have shootings in schools. These guys are on, uh, you know, committed to actually help solve a big social problem. And they, I, I started working with them when they were the duct tape robots demo, literally at Plug and Play Tech Center. Last year, we went through an IPO. Huge. So very proud of them. Uh, Damon uh, Motorcycles out of Canada. Uh, the company I launched in 10 days, um, high performance electric, you know, motorcycle, um, helped them, you know, secure over a hundred million in, in pre-orders. Um, and that was not a GoFundMe type, but I mean, this is like a real, you know, kind of order. So very excited for what's happening in that space. And Mon uh, Monarch Tractor, which is the go taking my agricultural rules is, you know, electric tractor and having the opportunity to work with Carlo Mondavi, who is a fifth generation farmer, but in the wine wine industry, that was, you know, really fun. I, I have so many, I mean, there's so many, in, you know, in, in, in the portfolio, but those particular three, I, I felt you know, my, my heart get a little tug because they're actually technologies that can save lives, technologies that actually can help make our life better. And working uh, on a couple of new things right now, UV 
uh, artificial intelligence UV sanitizing product that you can, we've all gotten a little lax after the pandemic and we just think we can go everywhere. Well, there's still a lot of nasty germs out there. And so being able to use your phone and as your, as basically the device that helps you kind of sanitize and clean things, that's a really good application of artificial intelligence, right? Um, working with uh, the next generation of, you know, tracking um, and where that's going, which think constellations in the sky. Um, working in things within aerospace uh, and the next frontier. I particularly want to go to space, so I'm really excited to work in that category. But those are some of the things I work on. But hit me up. I'm on LinkedIn, Donna Laughlin, and I love to hear, you know, entrepreneurial and innovator stories. So um, if I, you know, can help somebody just, you know, think about bringing their idea to market, I'm that's what I do all day long. I just make up shit and... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I really, it's really about listening to the the back end story. We have to listen. Oftentimes we don't listen, we respond. And so listening and, you know, tuning into yourself. I, I'm not joking when I say I start my day with, man, you know, manifestations and my am my, and I have a visual board and I create visual boards for my clients too. And so I, I've, I think one of the key things is for me is I lead with intention and, and, and I like to make impact. This has been an absolute masterclass for, you know, like uh, as a, as a founder and I know Raj is, is going through his own like seed round and, and, you know, early stage kind of growth. And this was absolutely amazing to not only understand from a personal level, like to keep, not only manifesting, but to keep putting yourself in those situations, but then also take a step back and really think about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and the impact it's going to make. So, uh, Donna, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. This was a lot of fun. Uh, Raj usually likes to end our episodes on a... On a I am question. not asking that question. I am not. <laughs> fuck, fuck that noise. So, Guy Raz, how I built this. You yeah, asked me my favorite song? <laughs> no, percentage-wise where you are today on a scale hard work versus luck and i'm not going to ask it i'm not asking <laughs> that shit i'm not i feel lucky as heck um <laughs> i work really hard <laughs> hard for the luck um you know it was just really funny because i was joking and i said you know do you want to know my favorite song and i just the song that's literally in my head is pr the prince song the girl in my hair i literally want to be that girl in your hair like can my clients come work with me I, it's like I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be in your hair and in a good way. That's not luck. It's not luck. <laughs> uh, the, I think 99% uh, hard work and like maybe 0.1% there. Can we <laughs> can we start a new show? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we we'll call it "Don't Be Safe" and you know, uh, "Don't Be Safe" with uh, Donna <laughs> and, and 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 Raj shows. I like that. It. Yeah, definitely. We can, it's amazing. We can work on it. But uh, Donna, we also like to end each episode with flowers um, as somebody who's worked with you. And not only that, but like as somebody who was, uh, you know, a young entrepreneur building the accelerator program, didn't know jack shit about what we were doing. Uh, I was very fortunate that Rand, my co-founder at the time, uh, knew you and connected us. And, you know, as young founders who you had to go through and walk on eggshells around really, really smart and motive and successful people. You were one of those amazing personalities who was able to tell us what we needed to do without overbearing or or without like really scaring us. And and as a as a you know PR professional, as somebody who um every founder should think about really working with at some time, it was an amazing experience for us and our portfolio company. So so thank you so much for back then. I know you work with tremendous amounts of founders since, and I know everybody loves you. Um, but hey, thank you so much again uh, for everything you do, and and best of luck with everything in the future. Well, thank you. No, that I totally. I mean, I can't believe it's been ten years, but um, I mean, just remember the the, uh, the time that we we spent together, and you know, that, those conversations actually just ignite more creativity too on my end. Well, for all our listeners, thank you again so much for joining us. A um, uh, quick plug in for our startup studios concierge. So where Raj and myself as founders, as XVCs, um, we 
are able to connect with early stage founders on a different level. So whatever problems you're dealing with, chances are we've either dealt with them ourselves or we know awesome people like Donna who can solve them for you. So please feel free to use the concierge. It's a free 20 minute conversation. And our job is to basically build our network around amazing founders and, and people and, and solve their problems fast. So definitely check it out. But otherwise, we will see you again next week with a brand new episode. Thank you so much. Thanks, Doc.